Hey everybody, so today I have a special guest that I have been looking forward to talking to for a very long time, and that is Clemency Wright. She is somebody that is an expert in keywording, has had many years of experience doing that, as well as creating taxonomies and helping people understand how do you use the taxonomy on your actual content. She also is very well versed in how do you apply this to things that are not textually based and that's images, videos, things like that, where there might be more emoting um, kind of tags that you might want to put on your content or your assets. This is something that I actually have started to dig into recently and I am just so thrilled that I got the chance to talk about how Clemency goes about doing this and she also has a few tips for you along the way. All right, so if this sounds interesting to you, let's keep watching. Oh, thanks, Ashley. Yeah, likewise. Um, I'm Clemency. I'm based in the UK in Newcastle upon Tyne in the northeast. Um, I've been keywording for nearly 20 years. Um, I started out with Getty. I work for the V&A. Um, so I've always worked with content, different kinds of content, keywording. Um, and now I have a small business and we specialize in keywording content for all sorts of organizations, um, as well as helping them to build controlled vocabularies and data schemas. So you know, you, you've been in this business for so long. How did you get started? I mean, what makes you love this thing that you're doing? Because you really do have a passion for it. Uh, yeah, I really do. I love what I do. I feel very lucky. Um, I mean, as a student, I was predominantly a literature student, um, but I also got um, a little chance to dabble in art history during my time in America when I was studying. Um, so I really had an interest in the way we look at visual content and what how we describe that and in particularly in terms of how we might describe it to another person who hasn't seen it yet and um, so I've always been interested in galleries and museums and the information panels that tell you not just about the artist and the context but about the painting or about the visual itself um, and I, I took my first job with Getty, having finished my studies um, as a search data editor, which is in effect a keyworder. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we had a team just focused on keywording, which felt pretty special. It's a great team. I'm still in touch with lots of them. They they all do different things now. Um, some of them have stayed in the industry. Some have moved into other into other areas. Um, but it was a very uh, sociable and community orientated um, organization in those days. We had a lot of fun. Um, and I also worked for Getty Search Vocab team as well. Um, so really, that was more not adding keywords to the assets, but thinking about the keywords we could build in mm -hmm. the back end search vocabulary um, to help the keywords add the keywords to the assets. So it was always pulling together my love for language, my interest in the language that we use, you know, as individuals, as communities, um, and the visual aspect of that obviously came into a into strong focus. Yeah, and, and that's that's a beautiful story. I've heard so many people um, accidentally get into to this work. It sounds like um, when you were doing things, it was a little bit more purposeful, which which is fascinating too. Because I would say maybe it's only in the last fifteen years that at least the word taxonomy has become a thing. I mean, it obviously existed before that, but. Um, it, it's only recently come into its own and really been used. Um, you know, I, I actually just was teaching a machine learning class on why is a taxonomy really valuable for a machine learning model, right? And I think the tags on the assets that you're talking about are of equal importance when you're doing any kind of machine learning as well. So can you walk us through when you are looking at an asset, you know, how how do you approach the problem? Not necessarily how do you do the keywording, but how do you first approach a, a new project for yourself? Well, I think this is a really good subject because keywording is looking at an asset and adding tags so people can find uh, the asset. And that asset could be in the retail space on an e-commerce commerce website, or it could be on the V&A Images website, or it could be, you know, on a specialist art collection, antiques firm or something like that. And so the important thing to do is, is to add the relevant meaningful words to help people really navigate to what it is they're looking for. But much broader than that, it's about understanding what the language will be um, that people are using to find that content. So you need to even understand, yes, more about 
the context that we're living in now. Um, so this is things like the culture, the social environment, the political climate and these things, because language, as we know, it's, it's changing so rapidly. The dictionary is being updated all the time. We've got um, social media channels, hashtag language, you know, all the, the kind of emoticons, emojis and all of that's visual language as well. Um, so when we're keywording, rather than thinking of a process of, oh, here's an asset, look at it, keyword it, you come with um, a knowledge or an understanding of the context in which you're keywording. So for me, working on my client projects, I have to know more about that client, about their organisation, about their culture, and also their users, which could be the internal staff actually doing the tagging or the internal staff doing the retrieving of metadata, um, the assets using metadata, or it could be their end customers. So you may be you know, you may be responsible for uploading assets to um, a web shop on um, Etsy, for example. Um, you've got to think about how your end users all over the world will use language to find that particular kind of product. Mm -hmm. um, but you also need to think about how your other products would fit into that language and how your marketing language fits into the tags that you're using on your assets and pull together um, all of that information um, to help um, people navigate to to the content so it doesn't start with looking at an asset and adding mm -hmm. tags or keywords it starts way before that um, and I think a big part of that is in my, it's in my nature to constantly observe some people call me nosy I think it's more <laughs> curiosity and um, but I, I have always been fascinated by everything that's going on around me and I think all that visual information comes in um, to help a keyworder because you are um, adding more value not you know not just looking at an image or a video but adding a little bit more of a context or you know a conceptual element to it. I absolutely love that you and I are of the same kindred spirit with that because I know that not everyone takes the same stance um, with with keywording or what I would call indexing and uh, it's it's so good to hear um, that you're you're taking more of this holistic approach, not just this is a thing I'm going to tag it and it's going to get out the door. Not really thinking about the larger implications of of what you're doing. I think that is so incredibly important. And there's this this big thing that a lot of people are talking about recently, although a lot of people have been working on it, is um, responsible AI. And it's almost like you're doing responsible keywording, right? Like you're thinking through like, what is the end user? What is the end use case? What is the, the, the whole ecosystem and what you're doing? And that's fabulous. I'm so glad to hear it. But so so you've been working in this field and, and you are certainly an expert. You've got your own business that, that you've been doing this with and you've worked for a lot of the big names um, in the past. But what are some of the things that you feel maybe need an overhaul um, in this space? Things that, you know, maybe were really great in the past, but maybe now we need to maybe uh, uh, give it a little bit new life. Yeah, I mean, there are a couple of big areas that that might relate to in my work. So one of them is the work I do with clients who are installing a new digital asset management system or a dam system. Um, the one of the problems I find recurring over and over again is is the lack of investment or the underinvestment in helping customers who have bought this dam system to manage their assets actually use it. And by that, I mean um, get a control vocabulary in place or a taxonomy that will really help power access and, and surface content, you know, relevant content to their particular users using the language that they need. Um, so there's usually someone in an organization who is tasked with that. Um, there may or may not be budget or resource to do it. Um, and often, you know, my job is to help um, those people who, who feel a bit bereft. They've, they've bought this expensive system, um, which does do lots of things and it's very configurable and it's got lots of elements to it. Um, and it has so much potential, but actually if your job day in, day out is to upload assets, uh, cat cat uh, catalog them, classify them, make them searchable, um, you might need a little bit more help than you actually get from say the, the vendor or through oh, yeah. the development. Yeah, so that's a recurrent theme. And, and, and like I say, a lot of my work will bring me in um, for that very reason. You know, that's kind of my job is to help solve. It's, I always think of it as bridging the gap. So you've got this amazing tool um, you know, this engine that's very, very powerful. You've got a user who's very knowledgeable 
and very passionate about their customer and their users and the information that they um, safeguard is very um, special to them. But it's it's finding the connect really between that person's mind and their way of working and the system and the technology. And I like to work really at the interface of those two things because you know, being an observant, nosy person, I like to ask a lot of questions of both my client and the vendor to see how much further we can, you know, really push that. Um, I think the other aspect of my work is m more so on the creative side, so on creative production and working with photographers, uh, mm -hmm. video makers and filmmakers. So um, a large part of our business is actually keywording for those creators that don't have time or don't mm -hmm. have the, you know, the, the knowledge perhaps or the interest is, is quite often an obvious one yeah. and to sit and keyword day in, day out. Um, so, you know, we developed this small team which is really focused on keywording um, for uh, photographers and filmmakers and um, for the stock photo industry. Um, mm. And one of the big challenges or things that we need to change there, um, it's not really aligned to keywording, but it's to do with the licensing models um, mm -hmm. because all this has a trickle down effect. So in order to do keywording, you do need some investment because it's a big part of your uh, marketing strategy. Yeah. Um, uh, license fees are, are being squeezed quite low now stock photography seems like it's not a viable option for many creatives which only further impacts in their ability or willingness to invest in keywording so i think really we need to think about search is critical to m most businesses now um particularly creatives you know trying to showcase their work online um, we need to find ways of helping them do that so my my kind of go-to response would be working with the agencies to hmm make sure that they're creating efficient tools within their workflow so that photographers can keyword their work efficiently easily and quickly or that they've got some support you know through some of the tools that you uh talk about like taxonomy yeah. and yep. and controlled vocabularies hierarchies and synonyms yep. and things like that yeah. so there's, there's there's two sides to it and um yeah. and i think you know i think developments are happening all the time every time i log on to linkedin or have a look at some of the blogs that i read regularly you know, there's always a merger, an acquisition, something's mm -hmm. gone under, something's, you know, there's a new agency. Um, in the stock photography space, the change yeah. is so rapid. You, you just need to um, keep keep ahead of that really and see and see where the opportunities are. Going back to your question about, you know, um, how did you get into it and that, you know, I am passionate about it. I think ultimately underlying the work that we do is the need to help people access information, even if they don't have uh, the knowledge, the experience or the education. So this is really fundamental. You know, it's a more fundamental role that we play in yeah. disseminating information, which, you know, as to your point about um, responsible AI and responsible keywording, we owe it to people when we're classifying content to make sure it will work for all people, you know, eliminate bias. I watched a really good uh, documentary film called Coded Bias um, on um Netflix, I think. Yeah. Um, and it was, um, you know, this inbuilt bias that we have based on the information that we're putting into machines that are doing the algorithms. So as keywords, we're really conscious of that, that we, um, you know, we're trying to avoid bias, but we're trying to reflect all walks of life, all different yeah. you know, opinions that people have and different experiences. But I think that is the thing that underlies classification. It's it's not it is a geeky thing i do think it's quite a sort of you know methodical <laughs> i like that i like the methodical process and i like to kind of see a job through to its end i like to apply the same strategies through all the projects and have it nice and tidy and yeah. but equally i accept that we are individuals and we have sporadic thoughts we have strange terminologies we have shared language and we have our own individual language so yeah. it's kind of marrying the kind of left and right side of the brain which i like um, and the fact that we do try and use information in a very egalitarian way and it's about educating people informing people Absolutely. allowing people to make informed decisions based on the information we give them so yeah. you know eliminating biases is really important to that Absolutely. What are what's some of your favorite stories about keywording that you could share? We've had some funny stories in the past. I mean, sometimes you get typos that just deliver um, a very dubious keyword result. Uh, and this has been through, you know, some really highly um, prestigious publishing agencies that I've worked with. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've really I think because it's so varied and we work on so many different kinds of projects, I think the ones that stand out for me are the ones that 
I feel like have really made a difference. And going back to this idea of helping people find information and why do we want people to have access to the information? Mm. What, 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 why is it important? And um, so the work I've done with charities and nonprofits like Save the Children have been very important to me. Um, and I would like to do more work like that because I feel that, you know, in terms of digital marketing and raising awareness from a campaigning and fundraising point of view, images really help tell that story and they really connect with users immediately so the work I did with Save the Children and other charities um, has been very rewarding for me um, and you know and challenging as well because we're going back to the um, the idea of terminology and what's appropriate and what's not appropriate and, 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 and not expecting people to know the language that we're thinking um, mm -hmm. when they type into a search engine so I think where we feel we can make a difference um, surfacing content that hasn't been seen before so working on archival footage for example mm -hmm. or very specialist footage um, like scientific footage is fascinating um, and I have keyworded some really interesting clips as well from the the, the animal kingdom and the human yeah. bio, uh, biology kind of space for, for some of my yeah. clients too so it's you know every day is different when you're keywording that's for sure yeah it's it's amazing what you see, you know, keywording for some, you know, really specialist food type industries or things like that. And um, and I think that's what we need to remember is every company, every business or organization has some assets, you know, often yes. visual assets that the only way you can find them is through either, you know, a hierarchical taxonomy that you know already or a search box, which is a blank space. And all you have is the reliance on it working in the back end. So we need yeah. to make that happen for people. Yeah, absolutely. And it is uh, bringing order to chaos through the taxonomy and the actual tagging process because we are so inundated with information and data every day and being able to sort through it and find the thing that you're actually looking for is more important than it ever has been. And it's, it's folks like you, folks like me that are working in this space that are making a little dent in that in that um, giant wave of, of information that's out there. Um, all right, so if you had some advice for somebody that is maybe just starting um, into this field or really wants to get their hands dirty um, with keywording, what's, what's some advice that you would give them? Um, well, I think a lot of people, as you say, fall into it by accident. So you may already be keywording and not really realize it. And in fact, we all do because we use them on Amazon and Google and Netflix, you know, yeah. to find things all the time. And um, if you're in an organization and you're looking to, to to become more involved in in that or with work with the teams that are responsible for that, um, then speak to the, the departments within your organization that use keywords a lot. So this could mm -hmm. be, you know, the, the product managers or it could be the marketing teams, the design advertising teams. Mm -hmm. If you're not in an organization and you want to get more involved, there's a lot of uh, helpful information and resources online, which I, you know, I, I do read a lot of blog posts and attend seminars online there's a lot of educational courses as well and I've been yeah. a part of the community called the Henry Stewart Dam community for a number of years and they are um running courses and events that you can attend some of those are for free some of them are paid for courses we've also got um some great dam digital asset management um newsletters and blog posts that we could share with with viewers mm -hmm. um and i think just stay really curious and speak to people that use keywords on a daily basis so whether they are you know your friends or neighbors your family your friends just ask them what what do you find works what doesn't work and then try and kind of tackle that problem so often the user will be the the best person to speak to and in some cases the less knowledge they have of what goes on behind the scenes the better um oh, yeah. but i think you yeah and you can um you can also you know reach out to other um consultants on linkedin i've got a really great network of people like yourself and you know a few other taxonomists ontologists knowledge graph people and um, consultants working in this space there i i've always found it a very sharing and supportive community so i'd like to just you know say a generic thank you to everyone that's kind of help me have discussions with me over the years because um i'd like to you know kind of give that back to people who are interested in getting into this field and and it's that it, it did pop up on um a thread this week in damn peeps which is uh, an online community for digital asset management 
professionals and um, you know it seems to be growing in popularity and, and as you say it's growing in um, application in mm -hmm. all of our lives so it's definitely a space to watch and one that I think will you know be quite exciting as more and more um, activities happen online I mean from education to you know all, all sorts of things all these activities and events that have gone completely from the physical space to the online space Absolutely. it's not to say you know they're not going to go back to to normal but I think you know being savvy and aware of how a digital platform works how a search engine works is is going to be really um you know be important and useful for many many people entering this yeah. field what is the difference of between keywording and taxonomy. So do you want to maybe express, you know, how, how do you handle those two topics when you're maybe even dealing with another, um, you know, vendor or one of your customers? So the way I would probably approach this is we use taxonomy to do our keywording. Um, we also create taxonomy where one doesn't exist. So they're both linked together. Yep. Um, you can keyword without a taxonomy, but mm -hmm. you would be kind of stabbing in the dark. Um, you, you know, if you were with your example of keywording toys, you need some kind of a taxonomy to know what the categories of the toys mm -hmm. are and mm -hmm. what the subcategories are. Um, so I guess um, it's an interesting relationship. One can exist without the other. But you definitely benefit when keywording if you have a taxonomy. I guess the question for lots of my projects is how on earth do you create a taxonomy for abstract photographs that are quite artistic in nature um, and very difficult to pin down in, in terms? And um, so the taxonomies for a lot of the work we do will be more like we said at the beginning around our ideas about culture and society mm -hmm. and the way people uh, respond to a visual, what emotions does it evoke in them? How can we convey that? So a taxonomy for a lot of the projects I do is is a list of concepts or feelings or, or you know, um, yeah. themes. Yeah, and um, so yeah. we draw on that, but we also obviously have to keep expanding a taxonomy because yeah. the keywords we need will keep growing and changing because culture's yeah. changing and society changing. Yeah. And we've got a whole raft of keywords for um, what's going on in the world at the moment and um, mm -hmm. what's going on in terms of how we label people, how we label gender, yeah. how we label, mm -hmm. label um, ethnicity. You know, all mm -hmm. of this changes the way we keyword, yeah. which has to yeah. mean we have to change the taxonomy. So it's kind of like a, you know, um, interrelated circle of, of knowledge, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's it's fascinating because um, you're talking about photographs and I can absolutely see how art and, you know, like what does it invoke in you and that kind of thing. I recently uh, was working with uh, a partner on, you know, doing something similar with books. So not as what is this book about or is this book fiction or nonfiction or, you know, autobiographical? It was how does this book make you feel? And it was actually for um, one of those um, subscription boxes that you can get. And so each box was themed with a feeling and it came with a candle and a book. And so they're trying to figure out how to categorize the books according to feeling. And I thought, oh, that's so cool. Um, yeah. So, you know, I was just giving them some advice on that. But you know, it is amazing when you have to break down not just what do you see on the screen, but how do people think and feel about some of the stuff that we're doing? It's not it's not often understood that that's a big part of our job. And it's really cool that you're really highlighting that. That's very interesting. I think I finished my yoga session last night and the next video that came up was some meditation music, but it was meditation for, I think, healing. And then there was another option, meditation for energy or for mental mm -hmm. agility. So, you know, you can't easily keyword a piece of music, but you have to assign some metadata. You have to give it a title which uses words that people will instantly connect with and know what you mean mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. you know and then also on you know my facebook feed i get offers for adverts for um you know boxes of, of clothing that can be delivered mm -hmm. to you once every month mm -hmm. or once every season yeah. and they're yeah. themed so they're not oh yeah. it's a ge it's jeans it's a shirt and it's a pair of boots it's like yeah. This theme is, you know, you are going on your girl's leisure weekend into the mm -hmm. mountains or you're doing whatever you're doing. And I think this is what, you, what you're saying as well, actually, yeah. is the metadata helps us to yeah. convey something that is not just a list of what it actually is. It's not just the actual attributes of a thing or a collection of things. Mm -hmm. It's the whole package uh, and, yeah. and what, you know, with one or two words, you can instantly create an impression like the book with, you know, 
10 different themes or 30 characters yeah. can be can, can be about through one or two conceptual terms so I think that's yeah. it's helpful um it's exciting it, it adds you know some kind of artistic uh, value to the to yeah. the world we live in and yeah. which is so data heavy um yeah. but I think people like that and I think a lot of yeah. the work that we're doing comes from that desire to yeah. to connect and have you know more of emotional response to yeah. the data that we're consuming Yep, but we have to do it responsibly, which I think we we've yeah, I'm, I'm in favor of that for sure. Yes, absolutely. Me, me as well. I have a whole series on equitable search is how do you break down the barriers that um, we are often building by saying, you know, this tag is saying this is what this thing is. But by definition, that also means what it is not. And sometimes, depending on what you're tagging, that could be very offensive. It could be really limiting to people. And making sure that we are constantly asking ourselves these questions as we're doing this work is so incredibly important. So, Clemency, I know that you you have your own business, and you are um, also you you are very active on social media. Um, at least on LinkedIn, where where I see you. Um, so how would folks who want to maybe get to know you a little bit better or maybe even contract with you, how would they get a hold of you? Um, well, I'm lucky that I have a fairly unusual name. So if you Google Clemency Wright, you you may see me um, pop up on Google. Um, but I have a website, which is clemency.co.uk. Um, and I'm active on LinkedIn and I like to speak to people on LinkedIn. So I really like to engage with um, posts and articles around keywording and digital asset management. So you can find me on, on LinkedIn um, by typing my name in there. Um, and yeah, I'd love to connect with anyone who wants to discuss this further or find out any more about the projects that I'm working on or or that my team are involved with. Yeah. All right, so I hope that you enjoyed that. I had a complete all right, I hope you really enjoyed that. I really had a great time talking to Clemency. She is amazing. Go check her out. If you need somebody to help you with keywording, go find her because she seems to really know what she's talking about. And I also really loved that we found a lot of commonality between the taxonomy and subject indexing world and the keywording world that she really is so great at. So it's really great to see this kind of interaction where we're all learning different terms for different things that kind of sort of might be similar or the same. And so there might be a future video on that. All right, so with that, I wanna thank you very much and I'll catch you next time.